Hello everyone and welcome to a new video. In last week's video I made a skirt that lights up and looks like a Christmas tree. And today I'll be making the matching bodice that completes the ensemble. I knew I wanted the bodice to be fitted and decorated with trims to match the skirt. And I was playing around with doing off the shoulder sleeves, so I knew the bodice had to be pretty structural to support itself. I draped the pattern on my dress form, then made several mock-ups to fine tune the fit before getting something I was happy with. Though a lot of the support comes from the shaping of the pattern and the bust cups, it'll also be heavily boned to hold itself up and offer a bit of reduction to the waistline. So here I'm tracing up my pattern onto a medium weight canvas which will serve as the base layer. It is positioned with the center front on the fold of the fabric, and in addition to tracing the outline onto the fabric, I'm also marking the top and bottom points of each bone. I used a ruler to connect those markings, then continued to use a ruler to measure outward from them to mark additional bone placements. I made sure there was a bone at least every two inches, as well as at the center back and one inch away from the center back. These will bracket the eyelets, and I wanted more support at the center and bust, so the bones are concentrated at those points too. After one side was marked, I flipped the material over, and the material is thin enough that I could see the shadows of the marking on the other side. I traced both the outline and the boning placement onto the other side of the fabric. Once the center fold is opened, the bodice pattern and boning channels should be symmetrically marked on both sides. And I'm not cutting around that outline just yet, that can wait until a bit later. Now I'm using pattern weights to hold down the bust cut pattern pieces and tracing around them. After they are outlined, the pattern can be removed and the pieces can be cut out. And I'm cutting these out for the same medium weight canvas material. Now I'm repeating that process but with both the bust cups and the bodice pattern. And these are being weighted and outlined onto a lightweight cotton which will serve as lining. And these pieces are all cut to size right after being marked. I'm pinning the bodice lining to the inside of the medium weight layer. The lining has been cut to the final size of the bodice, meaning its edges should align with the marked outline of the base layer. And the lining is lightweight enough that I can see the markings for the bones through it. Which is handy because the next step is sewing across those markings. Stitching across these creates a channel between the lining and base layers that boning can pass through. And as you could probably guess since you saw me mark them all, there were quite a lot of boning channels to sew, but the process goes pretty quickly once you get into it. It is, after all, just sewing straight lines. While I'm at the sewing machine, I'm also quickly seaming together the lining for the bust cups using half inch seam allowances. Speaking of the bust cups, now it is time to get an overlay on them. I played with a lot of different fabrics, but decided I liked the gold lame with an ivory glitter mesh overlay the best. It had the sparkle I wanted without being too brassy or greenish, which golds can sometimes come off as. And from the wrong side of the material, I'm pinning the pieces of fabric I cut for the bust cups from the canvas onto the lame and mesh combo, then roughly cutting them out. This was repeated for all pieces, and I made sure to mirror the pieces so it'd end up with a cup for the left and the right sides of the bodice, as opposed to two identical ones. I'm still working from the wrong side of the fabric, and I'm basting the base layer to the lame combo by machine. I used a long stitch length for this and made sure to stitch less than a half inch away from the edges of each piece, so these stitches will be hidden in the seam allowance later on. Now I'm cutting the overlay to match the dimensions of the canvas or the base layer. I didn't do this earlier on since it is a pain having to keep all the edges aligned, and the lame is also pretty prone to fraying. In my opinion, it is way easier to just trim off the excess after. Now I'm cutting out the overlay for the rest of the bodice, and this I'm actually cutting to size from the get-go since I have to seam together the front, and I need its dimensions to be accurate. Speaking of seaming the front, you might notice this pattern looks a little different from the one I used for the base layer. A wedge at the front has been folded inward, and this portion of the bodice will be pieced and have a different colored overlay. The goal is for the triangular wedge to follow the lines of the skirt and look like the point of the tree. Here I'm cutting out that triangular panel that will be pieced to the rest of the bodice. Now I'm pinning the larger bodice pieces to the glitter mesh overlay and roughly cutting around them. The mesh was basted onto the lame layer, and much like with the bust pieces earlier on, I used a longer stitch length and kept the stitching less than half an inch away from the edges to prevent them from being visible on the final garment. These steps were repeated for the wedge-shaped front section, but this time I used striped green organza for the overlay instead of glitter mesh, because it is supposed to look like it's part of the tree, which is also green. And this is also the same fabric combination I used for the lining of the tree skirt. After everything was basted, I trimmed away the excess overlay fabric so its edges were level with the lame. I said that word like 30 times in this video already and I still read it as lame in my voiceover notes. <laughs> Some things will never change. 
I pinned the diagonal edges of the bodice and wedge-shaped pieces together with the right sides facing each other. These were sewn with a half inch allowance. And I decided to edge stitch this seam too to make it look a bit crisper. Then I sewed up the center seam again with the half inch allowance. These seams were all pressed and now the outer layer fabric was done. So it was back to work on the base layer, at least briefly. I'm finally cutting off the excess fabric around the outline and trimming the now aligned base layer to the correct size. Then I'm pinning the outer layer atop the base layer and pinning them together so all the edges are even. I basted these layers together around the top and side edges, but I left the bottom edge open. The bottom edge needs to be open so I can add boning later on. Sewing across it to base the outer layer down would also sew the channels shut, so I'm depending on the other basted edges to hold it in place for the moment. And once again, while I was at the sewing machine, I also began assembling the bust cups. These are seamed together with half inch allowances, and the bottom two pieces are stitched together first. Then I pressed the seam open and edge stitched on either side of the seam, which is just stitching as close to the seam line as you can. I used to always call this top stitching, but I think when it is this close to the seam, it is supposed to be called edge stitching. But don't quote me on that. Don't quote me on anything, except for the fact that I have the cutest dogs in the world. Then from the wrong side, I aligned Rigline that was cut to be a quarter inch wide up with the seam and stitched the outer edge of it down. From the right side, this will just look like top stitching a quarter inch away from the seam, but is actually adding a lot of structure and support to the cup. Rigline is a type of plastic boning and a lot of people hate it because it is flimsy and malleable. So it doesn't add a ton of structure, but it is stiff and can be sewn through and worked well for adding some rigidity to these cups and these seams. I wouldn't want to make a corset out of it, but it certainly does have its uses in garment making in general. Now the top piece of the cup can be sewn on, and as you can see, I had to clip this seam allowance pretty dramatically before sewing to get the edges to match up. This seam allowance was edge stitched down as well. Then Reglin was sewn from the interior using the same method I used for the bottom portion of the cup. Now I'm matching the cups up with their corresponding cotton lining and pinning the layers together. By machine, I basted the lining in place for both cups. And now I'm going to bind the bottom edge of each cup with 5 eighths of an inch twill tape. One edge of the tape was stitched down, then it was folded over the raw edge and sewn down on the other side. Now I'm marking the seam allowance on the interior of the bodice where the bust cups will be sewn on. They are pretty fiddly to sew on, and following the stitch guide on the sewing machine can be hard with super curved seams so I find it's easier to have an actual line on the fabric to follow. That line also serves as a guide for the placement of the underwire casing, which is what I'm sewing on here. This casing is basically a tube made from a tightly woven fleecy feeling material. I'm sewing one edge of it on just below the marking I made at the underbust of the bodice. This casing will eventually hold the underwire that offers additional shaping to the cups. But first the cups are sewn on, and I'm sewing from the center of the cup to one side of the bodice, then from the center of the cup to the other side of the bodice, ensuring that the center point is positioned where it should be on both sides. After this was repeated on both sides, I folded the seam allowance down and edge stitched across it. I flipped the bound edge of the bust cup out of the way, then trimmed excess seam allowance at the under bust. Once this was done, the edge stitching forces the bound edge of the bust cup down, covering any remaining raw edges. At this point, the bodice looked like this. Please don't mind the puckers. LeMay is a menace and I did the best I could. When it's worn and tension is put on it, most of them will disappear. Now I'm taking the underwire I bought and I will link the source down below and inserting it into the casing at the under bust. I've never actually used underwire before and I'm not sure if you'll be able to see a difference, but these definitely added shaping to the bust of the garment. I was pretty impressed. Now onto something I have used before, a mixture of steel and plastic boning. These bones were cut or selected to be at least one inch shorter than their corresponding channel, and they were inserted accordingly. I used a mixture of steel and plastic because I wanted the rigidity of steel, but having it in every channel would have been unnecessary and heavy. So I put steel at the center front, center back, and sides, and alternated steel and plastic everywhere else. After all the channels were filled, I sewed across the bottom edge, a half inch away from the edge, creating a stopper that prevents the boning from escaping, and creating a guideline that I'll use a little later on. But first, I'm decorating the front with some red ribbons. I felt like the front looked a bit empty, and that these would jazz it up and help bring the vertical red ribbon details in the skirt into the bodice. I positioned and pinned these on by eye, then stitched them on by hand with gold thread. I figured any visible stitches would just add texture. I also made sure to sew one at the center front to cover up the center front seam. At this point, I was playing around with adding straps and sleeves. Puffed sleeves were part of my original plan for this, but trees don't have sleeves, and I wanted the focus to be on the triangular tree shape. 
So I decided to wear it with long gloves instead and leave the bodice strapless. Because of this, I no longer needed the slope upward towards the shoulder blades at the back. The high point is where the strap would attach, and without the straps, it looks odd. I'm marking a new top line for the bodice by eye, then trimming along the line and swapping the boning at that point out with something shorter. Now I'm sewing twill tape onto the bottom edge of the bodice. It's sewn on about a quarter inch away from the bottom edge of the bottice, so the tape's width easily covers the raw edge. Then I'm folding the bottom edge upward along the line of stitching I sewed earlier. This serves as a guide and ensures that the edge is turned inward by an even half inch. And the edge was permanently secured into this position by stitching the top edge of the twill tape to the lining by hand using whip stitches. And now I'm doing something a bit weird. I'm tacking ribbon to the bottom edge of the bodice, so it extends slightly below the bottom edge, and it is tacked to the interior every inch or two. At these points, the thread is knotted several times to hold the ribbon in place. Between these tacking stitches, the ribbon is flush with the bodice, but it isn't secured in any way, leaving gaps I can thread zip ties through later on. With the bottom edge neatly finished, and perhaps weirdly finished, I can move on to the top and the top edge will be bound with matching lame bias binding, which will be created from 2 inch wide strips cut on the fabric's diagonal grain, which is what I'm doing here. And I did back the lame with interfacing first, since without that it is really flimsy and would show lots of lumps and bumps beneath it. One edge of the soon to be binding was pressed inward by a half inch. The other edge was aligned with the top edge of the bodice with the bright sides facing each other, and it was sewn on with a half inch allowance. I didn't pin this, but I did sew it on somewhat slowly so I could follow the curvature of the edge. With it sewn on, I could fold the binding inward until it appeared to be half an inch wide from the exterior. Then I sewed it into this position by machine by stitching in the ditch of the binding, or at least that is what they call it in quilting. I'm sewing atop the seam point where the binding was initially sewn on. There's an indentation at this point that does a good job of hiding any stitching sewn atop it. The stitching will also be hidden later on by a garland. This binding nicely finishes off the top edge of the bodice and serves as a stopper preventing the underwire from escaping. Like with the bottom edge, I'm stitching twill tape a quarter inch away from both back edges of the bodice, so the tape extends beyond the fabric and covers its raw edge. Then I'm folding the fabric inward along the center back bone and stitching a half inch away from what will be the center back. This secures the seam allowance inward and creates a guideline for my eyelets. By hand, I'm whip stitching the outer edge of the twill tape to the lining. And at this point, I had put the bodice on my dress form and played around with some additional trims. And in doing so, I realized I wanted to incorporate some of the wider red ribbon into the design, specifically on either side of the pointed panel. And once again, I positioned the ribbon by eye, pinned it in place, and stitched it on using gold thread. Though this time I'm using a much more delicate hand and whip stitches to secure the ribbon down, because this ribbon acts more like plastic and less like fabric, and normal running stitches probably would have torn through it. Now for the closures. As I mentioned earlier, this will have eyelets at the back. These are sewn a half inch away from the center back edge between two pieces of boning, and they're spaced about an inch and a quarter apart. After they were marked, I used an eyelet punch to make a hole through all the layers of fabric. Then I used two strands of thick cotton floss in a Christmassy green color and stitched around each hole using whip stitches until the opening was densely covered with thread. Then the thread could be buried and tied off. And this was repeated a couple dozen times until eyelets span the center back of both sides of the bodice. The hand sewing continues, though this time it's more decorative. I'm whip stitching a garland on by hand over the bottom edge of the binding. This adds some sparkle and hides the top stitching along that edge. I also looped the garland at the center front to create a little sprig at the top of the triangular section to mimic a star at the top of the tree. To exaggerate the top of the tree further, I'll be sewing a bow to that point. I sewed the center of the bow on first, then I made the bow. The bow was positioned over the center, then the center is wrapped over the bow and whip stitched to the lining. We could have stopped here since that finishes up the normal construction of the bodice. But wait, there is more. I decided to make the bottom edge of the bodice look like the top tier of the skirt. To do this, I'm clipping pine sprigs off the wire garland. Once I had a good pile of them, I could move on to threading zip ties through the ribbon loops at the bottom of the bodice. Then I could zip tie on small bundles of sprigs. I tried to make this look actually tree-like, but not unflattering, which is basically how you could describe this entire project. Then so the zip ties were clipped, and then I decorated the branches with velvet bows and miniature ornaments that matched the larger ones, but were smaller and more flattering at the waistline. And that was pretty much it. 
Here are some photos of it on the dress form in all its finished glory, and perhaps more importantly, some photos of it being worn. In these, you can really see how the added tension on the bodice smooths out most of the wrinkles in Lil May. I must say I'm very pleased with both the fit and appearance of this finished ensemble. The tree trimmings on the bottom of the bodice blend so well into the skirt, and I still just adore how campy and Christmassy the skirt itself is. The bodice, though less exciting, I think complements it really well. I think the styling adds to it as well. I went for a 1950s feeling to match the flared silhouette, and I really do love it from the bow at the top of the headpiece to the bows at the tips of the shoes. I hope you guys love it too, and if you do, giving this video a like and a comment really helps me out and you should subscribe to see more of my work if you're interested. I'll have a Patreon exclusive video up soon all about making the headpiece that I wore with this project. But before I go, I do want to respond to the most frequently asked comment on my last video. Yes, you can sit in it. And on that note, I wish you all a happy holiday. <laughs>